Hello and welcome. My name is Coral Owen. I'm the Professional Development Coordinator for the Military Families Learning Network, and it's my pleasure to welcome you to today's session on Dietary Guidelines for Americans, and we'll be covering some revisions and uses during today's session. In case you're joining us for the first time, I'd like to give you a brief tour of our webinar platform so you can find your way around. Hopefully you're currently able to view the slides we're sharing. If you can't see them or having any other technical difficulties throughout today's session, please just send us an email for tech support at milfamln at gmail.com. As many of you have already done, we look forward to having you join us in the chat pod today for conversation and for questions as well as hellos. To embed the chat so you don't miss any links or conversation, simply place your cursor over the shared slides. You should then see a toolbar pop up across the bottom of your screen and then from there you can select that chat bubble icon. When typing your comments and questions, we'd invite you to select the all panelists and attendees response option. It's above, uh, right where it says type message here. This just ensures everyone who's on today's webinar is able to view those in the chat pod as they come through. We'll also be covering evaluation and continuing education information at the end of today's session. The Military Families Learning Network is part of a DOD USDA partnership for military families and our passion is to connect military family service providers and cooperative extension professionals to research and to each other through innovative online programming. I'll now turn things over to my colleague Robin Allen. She's the program coordinator with the MFL and Nutrition and Wellness team and she'll be introducing our presenter today. Robin. Thank you, Coral. Good morning. As Coral said, my name is Robin Allen, and I'm the program coordinator for the MFL and Nutrition and Wellness Concentration Area. We are happy to welcome the early intervention and early childhood professionals to this webinar. Today, I'm very excited to introduce our presenter, Dr. Sharon Donovan, PhD, RDN, Professor and Melissa M. Knoll, Endowed Chair in Nutrition and Health, Director of the Personalized Nutrition Initiative, University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign. Her research focuses on pediatric nutrition. Her research efforts have been recognized with awards from national and international organizations, including being elected to the National Academy of Medicine in 2017. She has served as president of the American Society for Nutrition at 2011 and 2012, and the International Society for Research on Human Milk and Lactation 2018 to 2020. Dr. Donovan was a member of the 2020 Dietary Guidelines for Americans Advisory Committee. I will now turn it over to Dr. Donovan. Okay, so thank you, Robin, for the kind introduction, and it's really my pleasure to be here with you this morning. As Robin mentioned, I was a member of the Dietary Guidelines um, Advisory Committee, and I chaired the Committee on Pregnancy and Lactation and was a member of the B24 Committee specifically. So the objectives today, um, which were developed earlier in the fall, so um, I actually thought at that time that there would be more differences between 2015 and, and 2020, um, but we'll get into that a bit later. But hopefully at the end of this presentation, you'll be able to describe the process for developing the guidelines, contrast some of the newer guidelines versus the 2015 version, and summarize the guidelines um, for pregnant and lactating women and children under two years of age. Due to time, I don't wasn't able to spend as much time on pregnant and lactating women, but I'd be happy to take questions um, afterwards. So this is our um, outline. So first I'll briefly describe what the guidelines are, how are they established, provide an overview of the 2020-2025 guidelines, also an overview of the current health status and intake, which is um, data that was gathered as part of the um, forming the guidelines and then end with applying the guidelines. So what are they? Again, most of the people on this call probably know that these are food-based recommendations to promote health, help prevent disease-related chronic diseases, and meet nutrient needs. Um, it's important to note that they're not intended to contain clinical guidelines. They're not intended to treat obesity, for example. However, the scientific evidence used to inform the guidelines does include people who are healthy, people at risk for 
or those that have cardiovascular disease, type 2 diabetes, and obesity. So, you know, acknowledging that these three chronic diseases are quite prevalent in the U.S. population, we wanted to examine the nutritional evidence for these diseases. But again, our guidelines really have much more of a public health focus. Um, they are clearly the cornerstone of federal nutrition programs, um, such as WIC and SNAP and um, school lunch programs, but they're also a go-to resource for health professionals and um, for physicians, dietitians, and others to, to help to translate that evidence. And so we'll, we'll talk about that later on. Um, they're published jointly every five years by a combination of USDA and HHS nutrition um, scientists. Um, and they're, sorry, this, is, this should be, however, um, they're mandated to um, reflect the preponderance of the scientific evidence. And this is um, something that um, we can talk about later that some of the reasons that the DGA did not entirely match the DGAC, they said because there wasn't a predominance of um, scientific evidence. So how are they established? So there were a couple new things to the process um, this cycle. Um, the first was the inclusion of B, the B24 in pregnant and lactating women, and that was um, due to a mandate in the 2014 Farm Bill. So prior versions of the um, dietary guidelines began at age two. Also, um, this cycle involved several new steps and that was in response to two national academy reports and after 2015 there was some controversy some feeling that um, the process wasn't transparent enough that the committee was going beyond their purview in terms of including recommendations on sustainability and others so the government asked the national academies to undertake a review of the process and so um, you can see at the bottom that resulted in two different reports that were published in 2017, one on the selection process for members and the other on the actual process itself. So based on those recommendations, there were a number of um, items that were added. And really, the overall goal is to make sure that the process is transparent, inclusive, and science-driven. So probably the biggest change is that the questions were developed a priori and were posted. So in the past, the committee was named, they came together, they decided what the questions would be. But this time, um, in the about one to two years prior to the committee being named, the government nutritionists and health professionals developed the questions, which were again vetted by the public and before finalization. So when the committee was named, each subcommittee was given its um, questions ahead of time. We also involved many new steps of peer review. So as we finished our chapters that went into the DGAC report, all of those were sent out for peer review. So we got feedback at that step. As I'll show you, there were multiple steps available for public comment. And then the final draft report was actually presented in a public forum as well, which had not been done in previous years. So just to summarize that this four stage process. So as I mentioned, the um, topics and supporting scientific questions were developed. Then the committee was appointed that was needed to be able to support those um, questions. The committee then did their work, published our report in July. Then from that point on until December, the, um, the government um, researchers and professionals and policymakers developed the guidelines. And so now we're actually in stage four. So the guidelines were released in December. And so now, now we're in the process of communicating um, the information and the translation and implementation. So just to give you a feel for how open of a process this has been. So throughout the process, we had a over a quarter of a million email subscribers. There were more than a million website views. And so all of these starred um, topics are ones that again were new or expanded in this cycle. We held seven public meetings, so six meetings with the committee plus the draft report. We had one outside of DC um, and there were three options for public comments. Um, so people could sign up to give um, 
basically three minute comments during three of the conferences, three of the meetings. And then altogether, there were more than 100,000 um, comments that came in from the public. So this is our committee member. We were members. We were um, the committee was a bit larger this year due to the expansion of the um, B24 and pregnancy and lactation. But you can see these are all um, um, PhDs and MDs working in academic and um, settings and hospitals. So the idea is that the committee provides that unbiased scientific review. And so the committee was um, assigned to six topic subcommittees, so pregnancy and lactation, B24, dietary patterns, beverages and added sugars, dietary fats and seafoods, and frequency of eating. And then there was a cross-cutting committee, the Dietary Analysis and Food Pattern Modeling Committee. And they basically supported the, the process as well as each of the subcommittees. So I just want to take you through, um, sometimes people aren't aware of the types of evidence that are used. And so the first is what we call data analysis. So that was taken on by the data analysis committee working with um, USDA and HHS um, staff. So this is an analysis of federal data sets. So a lot of what was used in Haines data, what we eat in America and others, as well as, as health status. So there were more than 150 analyses that were performed. And again, the goal is for us to understand what the current status is. And also, as you can see, to help um, make our advice practical, relevant, and achievable. The next step was the systematic reviews, or what we call NESSER, Nutrition Evidence Systematic Reviews. So these were the questions that were developed a priori. Then our committee members, basically, we set the criteria. We set an analytical framework with inclusion, exclusion criteria. Um, there's a standard um, protocol in NESSER for grading the evidence and grading bias. And then we made um, conclusion statements. And so throughout this process, again, more than a um, quarter of a million papers were screened by Nesser staff and nearly 1,500 made it into um, the final 33 original systematic reviews that were conducted. So a very um, scientific, rigorous um, process. And then the last, uh, whoops, sorry little tricky. The last is food pattern modeling. And so this is an analysis how changes in the amounts or types of foods in a beverage pattern might impact meeting nutrient needs across the U.S. population. So, you know, based on the data analysis where we know what people are eating, then based on the evidence of what people should be eating, can we develop food patterns that are going to help people in achieving those goals? So as we went through this process, so the, the committee, as we um, formed our conclusion statements and wrote our report, we were including all three of those. And so um, some evidence, for example, the recommendation to limit added sugar, um, a lot of that evidence came from the food pattern modeling aspect, as well as supported by the scientific evidence linking to chronic health and disease. But a lot of it came from, do we have room in our diets for added sugar? And if so, how much? So we reviewed the evidence. We wrote a report. It was a 834 page, very technical report intended for the government. And um, again, that was very highly accessed over 10,000 downloads in the first week. So then, as I mentioned, the second stage, the, um, the committee or the government wrote the guidelines. So they took what was in our report, as well as other um, input, previous editions, input from the public, et cetera, and then wrote the report, which was, um, as I mentioned, released in December. So this is our, our first poll. So the, the first poll question is the process for developing the dietary guidelines for Americans occurs behind closed doors with very little public input, true or false? Okay, so you can hit the survey and if you don't, um, if you're not able to see the survey, you can also put your answer in the chat. But um, I see right now we have 96% answering the answer is false, and that's true. So um, as I mentioned, this was a very 
open process for people to provide um, input throughout from the very beginning um, until final comments even on the final report. Okay, so going on to the next section. Um, so this is a, a picture of the website. So it's um, dietaryguidelines.gov. There's a very nice video that was part of the launch, but as I'll show you later on, as we talk about um, how do we apply the guidelines? There are a lot of resources available on this website. So I really encourage you to go and, and to start to dig around. I think one thing that's very unique this time is that the day this was launched, all of the educational materials were there and available, whereas in past, sometimes it took a little while for the My Plate to come out or the My Pyramid before that. But really, um, the, the extension was on the My Plate. Um, and so there's just, there's, um, resources as well as apps available. So when we look at the guidelines, one of the things they talk about in the report is they're consistent and evolving. So as we look over these reports every five years, we do see that many of the recommendations are consistent and we see that between 2015 and 2020, but they build upon these additions and evolve. And the feeling was that while many of the recommendations are consistent, in many cases, the scientific evidence was actually stronger to support that. So the guidelines reflect this in three ways. Again, this recognition that diet-related chronic diseases are very prevalent and that they pose a major health problem. And, and this idea that a fundamental premise is that just about everyone, no matter their health status, can benefit from shifting food and beverage choices. The second is a focus on dietary patterns. Again, this began in the 2005 version, um, was amplified in 2015 and then now in, in 2020. So these are consistent and evolving and the lifespan approach is new. As I mentioned, this is the first time we have um, beginning at birth. So it allowed the committee to really start to look at health across the lifespan, even including um, pregnant and lactating women. So this is the, the outline of the final report. So um, the first chapter is the background and um, process. The second chapter is on um, infants and toddlers. Um, then we go into children and adolescents, um, adults. And then we have a, another chapter on women who are pregnant or lactating and then older adults. So as you read the report, it's, it's quite different than, than previous um, versions because it does really take this lifestyle or life um, span approach. So when we take a big picture of the guidelines, there's there's four guidelines. So it's actually fairly simple as we'll see. We're, we're, we've kind of said these are the four most important things to consider. There's one what we call a charge, which was make every bite count with the dietary guidelines. And I'll have to say that this actually came out of the B24 subcommittee when we were looking at um, complementary foods and early feeding of children and infants. And we realized, man, there's just not a lot of room in, in the diet and particularly for added sugar. So Kay Dewey, the chair of that committee said, you know, there's a saying, you know, food before one is just for fun. And we said, no, we think that we parents really need to know how to make every bite count. And then that was actually adopted for the, the full guidelines. And then the three dietary principles that under um, sort of underlay this, um, meeting nutritional needs primarily through nutrient-dense foods, choose a variety of foods, pay attention to portion size. So, you know, as a dietitian, this harkens back to the um, balance variety and moderation, you know, that we've been talking about for decades. So um, the, the guidelines, so the first guideline is taking that life stage approach. So follow a healthy dietary pattern at every life stage. And um, we have different patterns, obviously, in infancy. But one thing that was, again, very consistent is that we found that um, even after that first year of life, so the 12 to 24 months, what constituted a healthy dietary pattern was fairly consistent throughout the life stage. So to me, that says that, you know, we can begin children after that first year on healthy patterns and start to set the stage for intake that will follow them, you know, throughout their lives. This idea of customization, enjoying nutrient dense foods and beverages that perfect, reflect personal preferences, cultural traditions and budgetary considerations. And, you know, this is, I think also this fact that 
the dietary guidelines need to be personalized and they need to meet preferences, but there's enough flexibility. And then, you know, when we were doing this during COVID <laughs> and we were seeing people becoming, you know, greater degrees of food insecurity. And so, you know, we were really being aware of what was happening outside of our committee and trying to, to make our recommendations relevant. And then the third is focus on meeting food groups with nutrient dense foods and beverages and, and um, stay within calorie limits. And then the last is the limiting foods and beverages higher in sugars, salts, um, saturated fat, sodium, and also limit alcoholic beverages. So this is our, our second poll question. And so the question is, which of the following are new to the 2020 guidelines um, not included in previous versions? So a focus on dietary patterns, guidelines for infants and toddlers, recommendations to limit sugar, and a recognition that chronic disease, diseases are prevalent in the US or all of the above. And again, if you can't see the poll, you can type your answer in the chat pod. Okay, so 55% um, are answering number two, which is there be the guidelines for infants and toddlers, and that's the correct answer. So all of these other elements were in that consistent but evolving category. Okay, so I'll talk a little bit about dietary patterns um, in, a, in a minute, but I wanted to focus um, right now on this dietary patterns before um, under age one, because this was really new to this report. And so um, we basically looked at it as three stages, birth to six months, around six months, and then 12 months um, through older adulthood. So the recommendation, we basically said, we already know what the dietary pattern is for this age range. So um, exclusively feed human milk, continue to feed human milk throughout the first year of life or longer if desired. If human milk's not avail available, then use an iron fortified infant formula and provide supplemental vitamin D beginning soon after birth. So the dietary guidelines are really meant to focus on food as a source of nutrients, but there are specific stages of the life cycle where supplementation is recommended and, and this is one. Um, iron during pregnancy is another. So at around six months, so notice we've put around six months, and this is consistent with AAP because this opens that opportunity to introduce potentially allergenic foods a little bit earlier. So at this time, it's really important to introduce nutrient dense complementary foods. Um, where our evidence again was consistent with the guidelines from American Academy of Pediatrics that there might be some benefit to in, um, introducing potentially allergenic foods such as peanuts to at-risk children, encouraging infants and toddlers to eat a variety of foods. And at this time it, from our um, food um, fat and modeling and intake, it was very clear that there's a significant possibility of gaps in iron and zinc intake, particularly for those infants fed human milk. So it's important that their complementary foods are rich in iron and zinc. And then after a year, begin to follow healthy dietary patterns throughout the life, lifespan. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about what those patterns are. So um, this is just to show you that the report contains some beautiful graphics throughout. And so I just pulled a couple out that I think are useful for um, educating um, patients and clients. So, you know, just simple swaps that people can make as ways to focus on nutrient density and reduce um, the salt and sugar that can be added during processing. So the, the second guideline is again, to customize and enjoy foods and beverages that reflect their preferences, traditions and budgetary constraints. So really the feeling is that a healthy dietary pattern can benefit everyone and that the guidelines provide a framework that people should be able to insert the foods that they want that would still be within the guidelines, but perhaps they, they don't eat a certain type of food for, the, for an individual reason whether it's religious or just food preference or cultural. So I just wanted to um, remind you what the dietary patterns are. So part of that report is to um, 
make recommendations that are designed to meet nutrient needs without exceeding calorie limits um, and also staying within limits for the potentially overconsumed components of sugar, saturated fat, and sodium. So in the report um, from 12 to 23 months, that we have dietary patterns at four calorie levels. And for two and older, there's actually 12 calorie levels. So if you're working with someone and you say, okay, you require 1800 calories, you can go and look and say, okay, if you follow the healthy US style pattern, at 1800 calories, these are the numbers of servings that you should be consuming from these different food groups to, to meet those um, goals. So again, the um, healthy US style, which I sometimes say is an oxymoron, but you will do the best we can. Um, so this is based on the types and proportions of foods that Americans typically consume, but trying to go to the more nutrient dense forms. And there's patterns for both infants um, or toddlers and, and adults. There's a healthy Mediterranean style, which contains more fruits and seafood and less dairy than the healthy US. And there's a pattern for adults, but not, not for the 12 to 23 months. And then the last is a healthy vegetarian. Um, it's important to note this is a, at all ages, this is a lacto-ovo vegetarian pattern. Um, but it contains more soy, lentils, beans, nuts, and seeds. And so it's not a vegan pattern. And that's because it's very difficult to meet certain nutrients from food alone on a vegan pattern. So if you're um, working with, with vegans, then you need to you know, do a little bit additional um, nutritional counseling and potentially the needs for supplementation. So the, the third guideline is, again, focus on meeting food groups um, from these nutrient-dense foods and stay within limits. And so the idea is that our nutritional needs should be met by nutrient-dense foods and beverages with no or little added um, sugar, saturated fat, and sodium in recommended amounts and within calorie limits. And one of the things, again, that was very consistent across the lifespan, um, that when we looked at what food components are most associated with meeting nutritional needs and reducing the risk of chronic disease, these were the foods that, that fell into those healthy dietary patterns. So vegetables, fruits, grains, um, half a whole. So you can see that's consistent with previous guidelines. Um, fat or low fat dairy, um, lactose free versions as well as fortified soy, animal and plant based protein foods and vegetable oils and oils and seafoods and nuts. So those are the types of foods that we should be encouraging people to consume. And again, this is just another nice visual, which shows um, how we can educate people about making a swap. So um, both in the amount or perhaps, you know, reducing changing from brown rice, um, white rice to brown rice, and then adding some lettuce. And so, you know, what you can do is work with people on what they, you know, using sliced avocados versus guacamole and um, little, little swaps, sugar, you know, um, iced tea with no sugar or water rather than iced tea with sugar. So what we, I think we really want to communicate is that it's not People can do this and they can, you can work within their preferences to, to do these, these changes. And I'll give you some examples later on as well. So th the final guideline, again, is to limit the foods and beverages high in sugar, saturated fat, sodium, and alcoholic beverages. And this is, a, again, a nice visual, which when the numbers were run <laughs> at each calorie level, if we're going to say we want to meet nutritional needs, micronutrient, macronutrient needs, and not exceed calorie intake, about 85% of the calories we eat each day need to come from healthy nutrient dense foods. And then there's about another 15% that can be used for um, added sugars and saturated fat and, and potentially alcohol. And so we're really only talking about 250 to 300 calories for most people. Um, and so you know, we really will need to avoid the foods that are high in sugar and saturated fat to not exceed nutrient intake. So one of the criticisms people had is, oh, the committee didn't talk about obesity and didn't treat obesity. But actually, many of our guidelines were all within the context of not exceeding energy intake and moderation and portion size, um, nutrient density. So, you know, while we say we're not treating obesity, certainly all of the guidelines that we talked about are in part of that prevention. So when we look at what the actual numbers were on our limits, so 
We had less than 10% of calories starting at age two and really avoiding sugars um, younger than age two. And that's just because there's, there's, not, there's no room. <laughs> and if they're eating a lot of sugary added foods with added sugar, then they'll be not meeting their nutrient requirements or exceeding their energy intake. Um, saturated fat, less than 10% of calories. Um, sodium, this was actually from a recent National Academies report. So we went with their recommendations. And this was, um, so sugar and bever alcoholic beverages where um, the final guidelines weren't quite as restrictive as the committee recommended. So we recommended less than 6%, but the guidelines say 10. And for alcoholic beverages, our committee actually recommended that it be one drink a day for both men and women. Um, but the final guidelines kept at two drinks per men, per, per day for men and one drink for women. So that is something when they came out, you know, there was a lot of controversy. It was sort of the shiny object I think that everybody focused on as well. The guidelines didn't follow what the DGAC said. But, you know, I think in spirit, the guidelines emphasize the importance of limiting sugar and alcoholic beverages, but they just didn't make the quantitative changes in the recommendations. So they, they kept the recommendations from the previous version. And, you know, they basically, this is the justification that they just didn't feel that our argument on the scientific justification um, was strong enough. And, you know, but they're clearly recommending, you know, to reduce these and to limit these, and it really encouraging more research um, before, you know, as we prepare for the 2025 version. So I'll be um, happy to, to take questions about these later on. I'm, I know I'm going a little bit quickly, but you'll have access to all the slides. So um, now we're going to talk about the current health status. And, you know, we, we hear this all the time. So part of looking at the, the data analysis, in addition to looking at what people eat, we also did an assessment of the health status. And so, you know, we, we know these numbers is 60% of Americans currently have at least one or more diet related diseases. About three quarters of um, Americans are overweight or obese, and about 40% of teens, children and teens are overweight or obese. And so, you know, we have big problems to solve. But we also know <laughs> that, you know, despite putting out these guidelines every five years, you know, we're, we're not seeing big improvements in the healthy eating index scores. So this is a sort of conglomerate score that gives a, an idea of diet quality. So I think that all of us as, you know, nutrition professionals in particular, we have to be saying, what can we do to to change people's dietary habits. And as I'll talk about later, this has to be everybody, you know, coming to the table. So not only the, the health professionals, but the food industry and, and the, um, the government and, and everyone working together. So the numbers I just showed you were overall, but when, when you drill down a little bit deeper, it gives you an idea that actually the two to four years of age and our older Americans do a little bit better. And we see this big dip in teenagers. Um, I think parents of teenagers know this is not a big surprise, but you know, when on the pregnancy and lactation committee, we're thinking, you know, these are our future mothers. <laughs> and Reagan Bailey, who chaired the data analysis, she talked about it being sort of a train wreck in terms of their nutritional status. And so I think, you know, talking to young women and teenagers about how important it is to achieve a healthy body weight, to um, make sure they're getting their iron and folate and calcium and all of these micronutrients as well. Um, I guess the good news is that we see that women who are pregnant or lactating, they actually see um, an improvement in their healthy eating index score so that we know that they're receptive to trying to improve their diet. But again, the maximum score is 100, so we still have a ways to go. And then when we, we look at, you know, what are the particular foods that we're either under consuming or over consuming, so the top, so basically the zero is meeting the requirements. So if we're in the purple bars are above the recommendations. So you see the usual suspects of our total grains, refined grains, meat and poultry, um, eggs. And where we're deficient, again, are in these foods that the scientific evidence shows are associated with the better dietary outcomes and health outcomes. So fruits and vegetables, whole grains, dairy and seafood. So these are um, 
you know, this, this swap between um, refined grains and whole grains is something that, um, again, could be an easy swap. We just need to get Americans more acclimated to eating those types of foods. Um, so these are a couple, I'm going to show you three different figures also from the report, but I, th I thought these were really interesting because they show in this case, what are the top sources and average intakes of added sugar. So you can see that on average, Americans are consuming about 266 calories per day. So at about 13% of calories. So um, even to get to 10%, the recommendation will be a, a cut. The primary sources of sugar in our diet are sugar sweetened beverages. If you look before that's um, below that's predominantly soft drinks but also desserts and sweet snacks at about 19 percent but you know we see like coffees and teas you know particularly the, the starbucks types of coffees that you know have all the whipped cream and sugars and things in them and also breakfast cereals candies and sugars and, and yogurt is in there as well so um so this is for sugar so now if we look at this is saturated fat and so the about 239 calories 11 percent of calories so we're not that much above the 10 percent recommendation so that's good news the primary source for sandwiches and and particularly hamburgers <laughs> but you also see desserts sweets and snacks here again so if we can educate people to eat less desserts and sweet snacks we can meet, be reducing not only their their sugar intake but also their saturated fat intake so it's kind of a you know a double benefit so again this is this idea of where can we target to improve the health? And so the last is sodium. And so you can see in this case, it's sandwiches. So again, getting people to maybe have their sandwiches with whole grain breads, adding more tomatoes and lettuce and less meat and cheese to their sandwiches and you know lower salt versions of things. It's a way of not only we can reduce sodium, but we could also reduce saturated fat at the same time. Again, here the average intakes were about a thousand milligrams um, over the recommendation of 2300. So to give you an idea where we're sitting and where we can, um, you know, make some changes. And so um, the last part is going to talk a little bit about implementation. And, and mainly what I'm doing here is I'm just going to be pointing you to some resources that are available. So again, just remember that the guidelines are developed and written for a professional audience. So the target is these government um, agencies as well as healthcare providers. So, you know, translation into actionable consumer messages and resources is really critical. And this is where I think, you know, many of you on this call can can do that. And, and you know, as I've shown you, there's a lot of resources that have been available, but we need to be getting that message out and helping people to interpret that evidence. Um, and again, the, the guidelines provide a framework for healthy dietary patterns at numerous calorie levels. Um, but we need broad and multi-sector collaboration. You know, we need action on many fronts. We need to make sure that healthy dietary choices are available in, in the supermarket, so they're in, in the home, the school, the work, um, when they're playing, and that they're affordable and accessible. And so really, everybody has a, a role to play. So the, um, I, I pointed to the guidelines, so you can go to um, dietaryguidelines.gov, you can download the whole report. Um, if you scroll down on this page, there's a nice video. Um, and then if you, actually this shifted over, so if you click on the resources, you will, there you will see some online materials that aren't part of the printed um, book, but here you can look at consumer resources, downloadable graphics, and under the about the process is you, you can see the dietary guidelines advisory committee report um, there. So I would recommend that you go and you know just start um, looking at what's available. So this is just an example of one of the um, really nice summary. So you'll see some of the figures that I've used is you know how do we make every bite count? Start by following the guidelines. You know understanding that none of us are really meeting the goals, but there's, you know, particularly stages of the life cycle that need, we need to likely be focusing on, you know, making every bite count. So these are, you know, 75% of people have diets low in fruits and vegetables, 63% um, exceed sugar limits, 77%. So, 
you know, while we're, while I said we're at 11% of calories for saturated fat and 10%, this is sort of the average intake, but three quarters of us, of us are exceeding that 10%. So, you know, it's not, it doesn't look as good as, as maybe I, I mentioned before. And that about 90% of us need to reduce our sodium intake. And this is that um, 85 15 rule and then these are the dietary principles so this is a nice um, thing to print out it has it all together um, I think also looking to the new nutrition facts label they've um, this is something that you can talk to your um, clients about you know with the new facts label some of the daily values have been updated um, so there's some new ones so for example you can see added sugar so they really tried to focus on these um, foods of public health concern. So the saturated fat, sodium, and added sugar, and, and also the um, focusing on the micronutrients of most uh, public health concern. And one thing that a uh, rule of thumb is if you're, if it's 5% or less, it's considered low. And if it's 20% or more, it's considered high. So in this case, this is, this food is providing 20% of your added sugars. Um, and, and really like, well, 14% of fiber, so that's not too bad, but it's not much saturated fat. So in terms of the, the recommendations. So that's one easy way to think about how do you put this into um, implementation. Another, um, again, they've, they've kept with the my plate icon for this, this round of the dietary guidelines. So this is a great example of consumer translation. Again, it can be used in various settings, adaptable to personal preferences, cultural food waste, traditions, and budget. Um, and again, professors or um, professionals across sectors can use it. So um, this is again showing how within my plate you can actually talk about all the dietary guidelines and where we're consuming too much or too little. So making half your plate fruits and vegetables, you know, focus on whole fruits, vary your vegetables, make your grain, half your grains whole, and then varying your protein routine. And, and this idea of, you know, swapping out some plant-based proteins for, um, for meats um, now and then, you know, this idea that we talk about now with the flexitarian diet that, um, you know, just try to get more variety in your, in your, food and then limiting and then moving to lower fat dairies. You know, we're seeing a lot of people moving to um, other types of nut drinks other than soy. And, and in some cases, you know, there just wasn't some of the evidence there. I think just when we talk to people that it's very important that they look at the protein content, um, particularly if they're working with, with children, because for example, rice milk only has one gram of protein um, per cup versus milk. Um, but the almonds and cashew and others are a little bit higher. Um, this is also, um, you can link to this from the dietary guidelines, but just so there's a, um, a little app uh, program online you can use. If you have your own website, you can use this widget and put it on your own website. So just to show, you know, what you can do is you click through so you can plug in the age, the sex, whether they're pregnant or breastfeeding, heights and weights. And then there's three choices for physical activity, less than 30 minutes, 30 to 60 or more than 60. And, you know, one of the questions came up about our very active military. Again, you choose the more than 60, but if somebody was really active, of course, you'd need to think about the extra calories they would need. And so once you enter that information, it's going to give you two choices. One would be to achieve a healthy weight. So a weight reduction and the other is to maintain. So um, then if you, you would choose one of those and then it takes you to, okay, for, for your age and this many calories, you should get a cup and a half of fruits and vegetables, uh, fruits, so two and a half cups of vegetables, six ounces. And it gives some examples, but also if you wanted to, to learn a little bit more or, you know, have your, your client work, um, walk through this, you know, if you click on fruits, for example, behind all of this is just so much other information. There's like, how much do I need? Why is it important? You know, what, what are in the groups? Whoops, sorry. Um, and like the serving sizes. So there's a table which shows you what a serving size is and some of the health benefits. So again, there's a lot of information. I think that's helpful. Um, there's also an app that you can download or um, have people download to their phones or and their you know, smart 
watches. So um, again, really encourage going out and, and getting, um, seeing what's there. And then if you, if there's things that aren't there, then, you know, communicating with the government in terms of, you know, these are great resources or, you know, have you thought about, you know, these other, other things, but it's really, if we're not putting it out there where professionals can use that and translate it to the public, then it's not going to be serving the, um, the ultimate goals. So um, I'd be happy to, to take any questions. I see there's some that have come in in the chat. Um, yes, Dr. Donovan, thank you very much. There have been uh, quite a few coming in the chat and I'll start from the beginning and hopefully we can get through them all. So Mark wants to know, I have not read the advisory committee report, but curious to know in what ways the committee's report differs from the new guidelines. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, I would have to say probably, um, well, in general, the report is, or the guidelines are, are more applicable so they, they've taken our very scientific report and, and put it into a little bit more accessible language, but that's still evidence-based. But as I mentioned, the two, the two things that they, they didn't do, which we suggested, was to lower the recommendation for added sugar from 10% of calories to 6% and reduce um, alcohol recommendations for men from two drinks a day to one drink a day. And so those were probably the two that received most of the public comment, you know, even during the deliberation process. But then after in July, when we submitted our report and between July and the actual guidelines came out, there was a lot of um, input on that. And, and basically, as I showed you the one slide there, their feeling is that they in looking at and in looking at our report and looking at our evidence, they didn't feel at this time that those reductions were, were warranted. Uh, thank you. So Karen wants to know, I've noticed new moms beginning with vegetables as complementary foods rather than iron fortified grains. What are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, this is something else that I've been quite involved with. And um, so I'm going to digress here a little bit. But what we're seeing in the US is that more women are initiating breastfeeding. It's we're we're doing really great in that. We still have some issues with duration, but we see a lot of women continuing to breastfeed in that second six months of life. And what we find at that point for iron and zinc, and in particular, those levels in human milk are quite low. And, and really the idea is that a term infant is born with iron in their liver, they becomes mobilized in that first six months. But in that second six months, they really do need an iron rich source. So this is a sort of unintended consequence of women really getting the message and breastfeeding more. What had filled that nutritional gap for many years was iron fortified rice cereals. But now the evidence is showing that these younger mothers are moving more away from prepared baby foods to things like baby lead weaning, but particularly the, the iron fortified cereals. And I think some of that is related to, you know, concerns that have been raised about arsenic. But we're really thinking that we're maybe seeing a tip of an iceberg in terms of iron insufficiency in predominantly breastfed infants in that second six months. And so if they're moving to vegetables, again, that is not going to be an iron rich source. So what we're um, recommending is that they can also move to meats and that these are sources of good sources of iron and zinc and B12. And the U.S. has been very unusual in that, you know, we, we did rice cereal for a long time because we thought it was the least allergenic food. But if you look outside the U.S., in many countries, meat is actually the first complementary food for infants. And, and there does not seem to be a concern about food allergies, you know, against meats in this age group. And even the evidence around peanuts and other um, things like egg and dairy is pointing to the fact that actually earlier antigen exposure might actually be beneficial rather than detrimental. So I would say if a parent decides not to use a, a baby grain cereal, um, but those are also supplemented with other things besides iron. I, I learned that now, um, that there's a lot of other nutrients in there that I would probably recommend that they move to um, trying to introduce some of the baby meats or certainly other foods that are going to be rich in iron and zinc and, and B12. Uh, Elisa wants to know about beef. The Mediterranean diet has virtually none. And the same Karen wants to know about dairy. Mm -hmm. Well, again, the, the, the food pattern modeling, part of that is that 
I believe the cutoff is at least 80%. So the food patterns are, are made to provide at least 80% of the um, of the nutrient requirements in order to, to fit that. And so, yes, while you're, you're moving out um, beef, you're moving in other alternative um, protein sources. And, and there's less dairy, but there's still dairy there. And, and some of that dairy could be yogurt, which again is a little bit more concentrated than milk. So, I mean, obviously a large proportion of the world lives on a Mediterranean diet and actually has improved health outcomes. I just think part of our education is to say, you know, there's certain foods and certain food groups that are richer in different nutrients. And so any of us who exclude an entire food group, whether it be dairy or meat or vegetables, you know, we need to know about what types of nutrients that we're not going to be able to, you can't replace the vitamin C in, in fruit with, you know, more servings of beef. So, um, you know, but the, the food pattern, if you follow the food pattern for the healthy Mediterranean, you, you should basically be able to meet 80% or more of the nutrient needs. And, and so, um, but if you see people are kind of waffling around that pattern, then you might need to talk to them specifically about nutrients they may need. And, you know, supplementation is always an option, but remember the dietary guidelines are their food-based recommendations. So, and then what are your, um, com any comments about fermented milk products and legumes? If there were, go ahead. Well, yeah, legumes are, are gonna be part of that vegetarian pattern, certainly. Um, as well as I think legumes are healthy for everybody. <laughs> and if you read the report, you know, there'll be this idea of swapping out um, animal, proteins for plant proteins for everybody, not just for people, you know, choosing vegetarian or plant-based diets. They also provide a good source of dietary fiber, which we know is a shortfall nutrient for many people. Um, again, we didn't have, remember the process this year is we had to be given a question. So there was really no question of what are the health benefits of fermented foods? <laughs> but what we found is that some fermented foods would fall within a healthy dietary pattern. And this is also something new is, you know, just this acknowledgement that people eat patterns of foods. You know, we eat foods as meals, we eat them in patterns which are shaped by our culture, etc. So you'll see that there wasn't as much of a focus on, you know, eat more of this type of food rather than eat a healthy dietary pattern that includes these types of foods. Um, again, fermented, there's a, we know, outside the dietary guidelines process that there, are, there is a lot of emerging evidence about the health of fermented um, foods, whether it's yogurt, kimchi, sauerkraut, and others. Um, and so maybe in the next version of the dietary guidelines, there will be, you know, more of a specific focus on that. But I'd say, you know, follow the dietary guidelines, but also follow the nutrition recommendations outside the guidelines if there's good advice, or if you just like certain foods. <laughs> So Leslie has a two-part question. DGAC went through such a rigorous and transparent process, but despite that, as we know, some suggestions were not adopted. What were the chances the procedure can be revised to require that if a reason exists to omit or accept only part of a conclusion or recommendations, the DGA must explain the rationale in full, providing mm -hmm. a reasoned explanation for any such omission, assures the public that the DGA took into account the scientific evidence. Yeah. Well, and that's text directly from the National Academy's recommendation. And, you know, I think that's something we can continue to, to push on. And, um, you know, speaking as not a DGAC member, but I, we were, you know, met the day before they were um, released. And the people particularly, you know, who did that work were a little upset <laughs> because, you know, they really felt that they did the rigorous work. And, and if you actually look at this recommendation for sugar, it's the same as it was in 2015. And if you look in the report, you know, if you dig into the report and you look at the numbers, it, it's hard to get more than six to 8% of your calories from added sugar and stay within the guidelines. Um, again, my personal opinion, I think it's a little bit of a missed opportunity. We know that not every person's going to meet that, but by lowering it, we put a little bit more pressure, I believe, on the food industry to be continuing to look at creative ways in which they can lower the salt and sugar in, and saturated fat in their products. Remember that most of the salt and sugar comes during the process of um, food processing, not what we're adding at the table. So, you know, I think that they, they may be 
could have kept their foot a little bit more on the lever and saying, you know, because then if, if they don't make these changes, they'll have to put on the label that, you know, it's maybe providing a higher percent of the sugar. So, um, you know, but we know that they're dedicated to, and all the language talks about, you know, that we do need to lower it. And, and also that these are sort of the upper end, you know, that the recommendation is below 10 is even better. Um, but I, I agree that, you know, it's something that continue to, to talk about how do we make that, that part, you know, from once the DGAC makes this report to the final guidelines, I, I think could be a bit more transparent. So the second part, eco ecological sustainability is critical to what we eat and our nation's health. How can we ensure the agency acknowledges that sustainability is critical to our dietary patterns and well within the scope of the DGAs? Mm -hmm. Well, again, in our executive summary and in our future directions, because I, I added this part personally, I actually went back to the 2015 report and looked at what they said about sustainability and pretty much lifted most of that language and modify it because I, I also agree. And I think that most Americans understand that we need to look at sustainable ways to, to, you know, harvest fish, <laughs> to, to raise animals, to raise crops that are going to be healthy for us. I mean, this is some sustainability is, you know, going to make things more difficult. Um, but you know, for planetary health, these changes need to be made. Um, you know, most of the pushback last time was not necessarily from the public as much as um, from certain constituents that, that felt, you know, their states or whatever were big beef states or others, and, and they didn't like to see that restriction. But I, I think times change and we evolve. And, you know, this is something that's very timely and important. Um, so I think that that pressure was not a question. We get that. Why didn't you address it? It was not a question we were given, but we did make that recommendation in our executive summary and future directions that it needs to stay on the table. Okay, and just a couple more questions that we have time for, um, and we can, if Dr. Donovan is willing, if, if there are questions that didn't get answered, maybe we can post the answers as a, on our blog page if that's sure that. yeah I need to I have another thing that starts on the hour but I'm happy to stay and and certainly give me the questions we'll post them people can reach out to me directly as well and that's fine excellent okay uh, last question because we have quite a bit to wrap up Joe was there any mention of how scientific support for the restriction on saturated fat is weakening and that excess mm -hmm. in omega-6 can be a problem um well yeah I'd have to say that was one of the things that we got a lot of um attention I could say from the nutrition coalition that is pushing very hard you know that about the scientific evidence and and I will agree again remember that every recommendation is based on the systematic review and of the literature and I know that this was a recommendation that was criticized because there's still a lot of focus on um, saturated fat and choosing lower dairy lower and non-fat dairy but there is, as, as was mentioned, um, emerging evidence, particularly for dairy fat. The dairy fat is different than beef fat, and they have different metabolic effects. There, are, there is emerging evidence. I do think that in the next version that this will be able to be teased out a bit more. But, you know, the committee... I think that there's these thoughts somehow and in, in going in that the committee is somehow being influenced by these outside forces and our own preconceptions, but the process is so rigorous and it's based on scientific evidence. The evidence is what the evidence is. And, um, you know, people might say, well, we didn't think you interpreted it correctly, but, you know, it's something that those subcommittees worked very hard on and then the whole committee had to come in agreement with. But the wonderful thing about nutrition is there's always new evidence and there's always a lot of controversy. So I think this is, you know, part of, of the public to keep also talking about what would they like to see in the next version of the guidelines. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Donovan. This was very interesting and so uh, needed right now as these new guidelines come out. And thank you everyone for sharing your questions. We'll get that blog post, your answers posted.
So we hope you will join us this spring for the 2021 Military Family Readiness Academy Series, Disaster and Hazard Readiness in Action. We will focus on the skills, context, and situations military family service providers may draw from and navigate as they manage disasters and emergencies within their professional fields. A continuation from the 2020 Academy Series, Disaster and Hazard Readiness Foundations. This year's series builds on basic concept of disaster and hazard management, including impacts, responses, planning, collaboration, and mitigation. You can choose from a wide range of sessions that will prepare providers to support the readiness and well-being of military families during disasters and hazards in areas such as caregiving, children and family needs, nutrition, and finances. Sessions begin February 10th, so be sure to sign up today on the, on the website shown below. And Nutrition and Wellness is very happy to bring you this upcoming webinar as part of the Military Family Readiness Academy series, Food and Nutrition Before, During, and After Disasters, Wednesday, February 24th, 11 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. And so we are happy to be offering, Nutrition and Wellness is offering one CPU for registered dietitians and dietetic technicians and one CE credit for early interventionists and early childhood professionals. For dietitians to receive your CDR CPEU certificate, please visit the webinar event page. You will find the purple evaluation link on, your, on the event page. After completing the evaluation, you'll be directed to fill in your name and email. Your CPEU certificate will be emailed to you. Government addresses such as .mil and .gov frequently will not accept the automatic email, automated email, so please use a personal email address. Any questions about your certificate, please contact Kristen DiFilippo. Her email is listed on this slide. For early interventionists and early childhood professionals, uh, please also visit the event page and locate the purple evaluation link, link. You to receive continuing education credits or certificate of completion, all EI participants will need to complete a two-step process. First, you must complete an evaluation. After you submit the evaluation, an end of survey message will appear. You will need to read this information carefully and choose the link that best fits your professional role. The link you select will take you to another survey or post test. Please note all participants seeking any kind of certificate will be asked to input an email address. Depending on the link you select, you may be asked to answer additional questions. After successfully completing the second step, a certificate will be automatically emailed to you within 24 to 48 hours. If you have any questions, please contact early the early intervention team at the email listed in the chat pod. And a recording of today's webinar, okay, I'll go to the next thing. Okay. A recording of today's webinar will be archived within 48 hours to our YouTube channel, which you can access via the event page. You can go to the next slide, Coral. We invite you to stay connected to the MFLN Nutrition and Wellness team. You can subscribe to our listserv on our website to receive the quarterly newsletters and other information on upcoming webinars. Also follow us on Twitter for webinar reminders and information related to nutrition, physical activity, and overall well-being. Now I will turn it back over to Coral. Thank you so much, Robin. Another massive thank you to Dr. Donovan for sharing her expertise and time with us today. And thank you everyone for the fantastic questions. We will stay on for just a minute or two longer in case you need to uh, access this information, but please do note, as Robin mentioned, the event page for today's session is your one-stop shop for all things concerning today's webinar, including the evaluation link, uh, follow that uh, purple continue education button. You can also locate the slides, additional resources that were mentioned throughout today's webinar. And of course, if you would like to go back and review any of the information or share this recording with anyone else, that recording will be available within one to two business days. For anything else beyond that, please send us an email uh, if you need additional assistance. And we look forward to seeing you at the Military Family Readiness Academy sessions this spring. Take care and thanks again for joining us.